This is a Red FM Vancouver podcast. Make sure you hit subscribe for more great content. For further info, log on to redfm.ca. Ishan Veerman, good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us today. You're so welcome. So, Ishan, what do you think that this pandemic is a blessing in disguise? I I really do think it is. I think there are lots of silver linings uh, about it that people might not just be aware of or not present to. Um, but I think it is a great thing. It's a massive reset for society, for businesses, for everybody. How do you think that the family dynamics are changed? Well, I think that it's going to highlight things that already weren't working in families, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, when you all of a sudden have to spend a lot more time with your family, you get really present to what doesn't work. It's like it's like a big spotlight on what doesn't work, right? Mm-hmm. So I think it's really good for children. Children are, the, I think, the happiest people around because the parents are home, you know, other members of the family, they're home, and they can do whatever they want all day. So that kind of uh, change, I think, the parents used to go out in the morning, they're not home till, you know, it's dark, and they have very uh, few hours with the parents. Now that time has increased. Yeah. Well, parents are having to be a bit more responsible about parenting their children these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Like, they don't have a teacher to oversee everything their kid's doing. So it is a whole new world, isn't it? That's true. But we- the kids that I've talked to are actually, the kids were going through just as much emotionally as their parents were going through because kids are used to seeing their friends every day. Mm-hmm. And lots of people were ready, I think, you know. They wanted to do. They were anxious to do something, any, anything productive, like fun. And uh, I think some of the people are really enjoying this time. Yeah, I think if they're honest, they are. There may be pieces about it that don't work, or pieces that they're having difficult with. But if people are honest, there's pieces that do work for them about being stuck at home or about being home more often. I mean, I'm, I'm talking to families that are, you know, dads that are getting to know their kids at a whole new level for the first time because it's the first time to love a time with them. Mm-hmm. So as a life coach, what's your experience when you're coaching and counseling them? How are they feeling? Are they feeling anxious? I'd say about easily 20% of people are extremely anxious. So some people are much more afraid of what's going on, and they should be. They should be. I don't think that per the world is taking this as serious as it actually is. I mean, I've actually talked to people who thought COVID was a conspiracy, that it didn't even exist, Mm -hmm. right? And I said, well, that's just because you don't know anybody that's been hit with COVID, or you don't have anybody in your life working on the front lines right now. Mm -hmm. Because if you have somebody in your life that's over the age of 70 um, and has health problems, or you have somebody in your family that works the front lines, works at a hospital or works, you know, somewhere where they're on the front line, you are more concerned about what's going on because you know it can be dangerous, right? Mm-hmm. Well, don't you think this um, isolation will create some kind of feeling of loneliness? Well, I think if you already lived on your own, that's definitely there. So if you were already someone who lived on your own, then the isolation caused by COVID is making your loneliness worse. It's not, it's not making you lonely. It's just making what you already had more extreme. But there are couples that never really assessed their relationship. They were getting by because one of them will go in the morning, they come in late, and then they're busy. They never really had that much of time sit down together and assess their relationship. No, because there was plenty of time, a lot of people still working from home, they have a lot of time. Don't you think that um, for some of them, it's a time of anxiety and some people are fighting, as a matter of fact. How do you deal with them? Well, you know, you're right. When in situations where things already weren't working, this is not making it better. Okay, like I said, the forced isolation of this is going to make whatever situation you're deal with at home seem more extreme. Mm-hmm. So if you already weren't getting along, you're going to get along probably that much more work, like less. Do you know what I mean? Like, do you remember a couple months ago we were talking on the show about how, um, 
how people don't set themselves up in their relationships at home to work anyway. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, parents don't even go on date nights together. Like, they don't even have a time where it's just them to build their relationship. Mm-hmm. Right? So given that they don't have that time together, okay, that time together is important to solidify a working partnership in the relationship. Just because you get married doesn't automatically make you partners. Mm-hmm. But people who spend very little time with each other are now spending almost all day with each other. It can, you know, go, uh, some, somebody will be, you know, some people can be very nervous. What can it do to the relationship? Well, I think that it's going to put everything on the relationship that doesn't work under a big spotlight. And so people are going to have to deal with what doesn't work about their relationship. And mm. sometimes spending 24-7 with the same person doesn't work for a relationship. So how are you going to have alone time? How are you going to have together time? And how are you going to have family time in a way that works? Mm-hmm. So um, what is this emotional eating? A lot of people are working from home. They're working from the kitchen. They're working right close to the pantry. So emotional eating is uh, another way of life now when we're working from home? No, I don't think so. I think that's a crockable. I think if you're trying to blame COVID for your emotional eating, you know, you're just giving COVID the excuse. Mm -hmm. If you're an emotional eater, you're an emotional eater, and you do that whether you're at home or not. An emotional eater, if they're having a bad day, will go out and get a carb-filled lunch on their lunch hour rather than a salad. They'll do that if they're an emotional eater. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter if they're at home. They're going to find what they want. I think we're blaming COVID for things that COVID is not to blame for, personally. Mm -hmm. By the way, did you know that over 80% of people that are getting COVID are getting it at home? No, oh, are they? I don't know that. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. I've been working with a company, a really great company called Yellow Cross, who <laughs> is certifying... Um, and uh, uh, certifying people in being COVID safe. Mm -hmm. So they're literally giving the training to certify people because nobody knows what to do to have themselves be safe, whether they're at home or not. Most people don't know what to do. And um, I was looking at some of their statistics that they've gathered, and almost everybody who's catching it that doesn't live in a care home has been catching it at home because people come home and they're not being careful, and they bring it into the house, which makes everybody in their home at risk, right? Mm -hmm. So so then there they are, they're sitting at home, they don't even know they're at risk, so they're already having issues with their family that they have to see way more often than they did, right? Now they're wondering what they're going to do to give themselves private time and how they're going to deal with productivity, because that's a big thing, by the way, that I've been getting a lot of calls about. How do I be productive working from home when I've got my family there, my, you know, um, in, and I got a call from a woman yesterday, and she's got three children, mm -hmm. and her husband is now working from home, and she's now working from home, and he runs a trucking company. So he's only there for short spurts of time, or and then he's in the truck, right? Mm -hmm. But even the short spurts of time that he's home, there's always a big kerfuffle because no one's used to having dad home during that time. Mm -hmm. And she's not used to working from home. So she's got conference calls to be on or whatever. Her boss calls her and wants to have a conversation with her, and she's got kids interrupting her, and now she's got her husband home for the first time. You know, there's things to deal with that she didn't have to deal with when she went to work. Hmm. I think, um, I know in some case, uh, when this lady was on a Zoom meeting, and the dogs start barking, and uh, boss find her or something, uh, I think they suspended her from her job. So those kind of incidents are really alarming, in this uh, large family system, I know you have uh, many South Asian clients. And in our joint family system, how you find solitude or time for yourself or time that you can work and attend those meetings? Well, I would do it in two ways, okay? So first of all, I would make sure that there's a space at the house that's set up, even if it's your bedroom, that when the door to the bedroom is closed, no one's allowed to interrupt. Mm-hmm. Right? This should be a rule you automatically have anyway. If you don't automatically have this and you have children, this could get you into trouble if you don't have this rule. If the door to the bedroom is shut, <laughs> don't enter the bedroom. Yeah. Right? Or if the door to the office is shut, don't enter the office. There should be a big sign on the door that says, if this door is shut, I'm not interruptible at the moment. Mm -hmm. 
right? But that's a quiet space. So then when you want to have, when you're on a Zoom call or when you just need 15 minutes to do a quick little, you know, meditation or reset, mind reset for yourself during the day, you have a place where you can go and close the door and everybody knows that that door is closed, you can't open it. I mean, unless the house is on fire or something. So having a space that's reserved for that, for the family and for you and for your family and your house is important. So that's the first thing, okay? Having space. Then the second thing is we need to train the people around us when we're available and when we're not. See, before COVID, if mom was home, mom was available. Mm -hmm. If dad was home, dad was available before COVID. But nowadays, if they're home, that doesn't necessarily mean they're available for everybody. That's true. So it's, yeah. Yeah. So establishing the rules of availability is really important. And it just works if you can go behind a closed door and close the door. Because even a four year old know, can know if the door's closed, I, I'm not allowed in. But if the door's open, I can come in. So, Jean, do you think these kind of times, um, anxiety and stress increases? Sure. Absolutely. Of course, it increases with any, any major life or world event, increases stress and anxiety. So how to deal with this anxiety? Well, first of all, education is the number one thing. Mm -hmm. There's two ways to educate yourself, okay? Um, educate yourself on COVID, right? Which is, I did by going to yellowcross.org, right? It's a nonprofit. So get yourself educated on what it is and, and so that you know when you're being dangerous and when you're not being dangerous. So that part of your anxiety is off the table. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be anxious about that piece. Because, you see, most people don't know or aren't aware of what's actually happening in the world of COVID. Because we're lucky here in British Columbia. I mean, I don't know if you've seen it, but in Texas, for example, what they're dealing with down there is, like, insane. Do you know they're still having NASCAR races, and sometimes 30,000 people are going to these races, and they go home, and 10,000 end up with COVID? Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we're very lucky where we are in that our rules for getting groups of people together have been very strong, okay? So the first step is get yourself educated about COVID. So that level of stress and anxiety, you don't have to deal with anymore, okay? That's mm -hmm. the first thing. And then the second thing is, is actually get yourself educated where you are at in your anxiety level. Like, for example, ask yourself every day, at the beginning of your day and the end of your day, okay, where's my stress level at right now? Okay, am I stressed out about anything? Is there anybody I should communicate what I'm stressed out about? Hey, how do you measure your stress level? That's another interesting thing. Yeah, I do it, I do it on a scale of 1 to 10 to make it easy for people. Where 10 is like, I'm so stressed out, I can't do anything. I can't even wash my dishes, I'm so stressed out. Where 1 is, I don't even know what stress is, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. So I would place yourself on a scale and check in with yourself every day on your scale. Okay, tell me the formula. So if I'm checking, like, where is my stress level today? So what is the first step? So the first step would be like, okay, if, if I had no stress, I'd be at a zero. Mm -hmm. And if I had so much stress that I couldn't even take any actions, like I can't even get out of bed because I'm so stressed out and so anxious, mm -hmm. that's the spectrum. So if you're able to get out of bed and you're functioning, right, then you can put your, start yourself at a five. Okay. Okay, okay. If you're not able to get out of bed and you're not functioning, then that's below five, and you should call someone. I would call a helpline. I would call a friend. I would call a coach like me. I would call somebody if you're less than five. Okay, if let's say you get up and you're functioning, and you think uh, then you're at five. Yeah, so then, you're, then you start at five. So, so I, I get up, I can get up out of bed, and I can go to work. I'm not, you know, whether it's at homework or work, work, right? So I'm going to work. So that's at a five. Okay. How productive is my anxiety or my stress getting in the way of my productivity? In other words, mm -hmm. how I look at it is, am I doing what I said I would do? If I'm not, I'm probably more stressed out than I realize. And I'm going to add a couple of points on there. So if I'm not doing what I said I would do, then I'm going to add a couple of points. So now I'm at a seven out of 10. Hmm. Because whether I'm doing what I said I would do is a great indicator of how stressed out I am. Mm -hmm. Because people that are stressed out don't keep their word or don't keep their schedule. 
Okay, what if a person is uh, getting up in the bathroom, he's singing and whistling and humming, and uh, then he goes downstairs and then just have breakfast and uh, ready for the work and hugging and, you know, just kissing the children and then he drives and gets in the car and listening to music. Is that a zero or it's still there's some level of stress? Well, I would say he may have, that person may have some physical stress, but they don't have mindset stress necessarily. And mindset stress actually makes up 80%. Mm -hmm. So they may have some physical things that they deal with. But what you just said was so great, because what you just laid out is what a regular ritual for the morning would look like for most people. Mm -hmm. I call them daily rituals for success. So there are things that we do every day that set us up powerfully for that day. So what are those things? Well, for example, everybody, lots of people shower every day and brush their teeth every day. That sets them up physically. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then other people might do some journaling. They might do some meditation. They might do, um, they might write their list of the top 10 things they want to do that day. They might. So there's a lot of different things that you could do. And by the way, um, I'll give the number that people can send me their email address to at the end of the show because there are daily rituals for success that I can send to people that they can try, okay? Because I think having daily things that you do to reduce your stress level is really important. Yeah. Yeah. Some but, people put but, exercise on that list, things that they do every day to keep their stress level down is that they go for a walk or they do some form of exercise. But does those things work on everybody? Well, that's why you've got to test and tweak. See, walking doesn't relieve my stress, but swimming does. Mm -hmm. That's why you have to test different things out to see how your body responds. Mm. I know grandparents were spending two hours with their grandchildren is like the highlight of their day. Mm -hmm. It doesn't stress them out at all. But I know other grandparents that are taking care of their grandchildren right, and are with those kids all day, where that is stressful, and they now need to do stress relief when they're done, their shift with their grandchildren. So it's different for each person. Okay, how can you be stress resistant? Can you develop something that if somebody even want to give you stress, or there is some atmosphere of stress that you don't take stress? Sure. Sure, oh. absolutely you can. It's a muscle. So stress um, and our ability to handle stress is, is a muscle just like our uh, arm muscles, right? Mm -hmm. If our arm muscle is weak, there are certain exercises that we can do to strengthen our arm muscle. Yeah. Okay? There's exercises you can do to increase your ability to handle stress. So, um, and different experts will tell you different things. But what I'm going to say is there's different areas of life that the activities would be different. So, for example... If you, one of the ways to relieve stress is to make sure you exercise regularly. In mm. other words, you exercise for at least 20 minutes to turn on the hormones in the brain, the good feel good hormones, otherwise known as serotonin, to turn the good feel good hormones on in your brain takes 20 minutes of exercise before those hormones get released. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you were looking at physical stress, exercising is a great way of dealing with that. Hmm. Okay. Um, and, and physical exercise also helps deal with mental stress. It reduces that because, because of that hormone that gets released in the brain when we exercise. It's a feel-good hormone. So it makes us feel good not only physically, it makes us feel good emotionally and mentally. Mm -hmm. Because uh, so no, nowadays people have sometimes when they're staying home, uh, some of them said that uh, they have a hard time getting... Um, you know, elevate their mood. Their mood is down. So in order to kind of be happy and be upbeat, then those exercises will help? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you talk to anybody, any physical fitness trainer will tell you that regular exercise makes a difference to your overall mental, physical, and emotional well-being. Absolutely. 100%. Any doctor will tell you as well. But now the, um, they're saying that the, another phase of pandemic will come in. A lot of people are being stressed from that. That, you know, what's the use, staying home Friday? It is Friday. It's not going to help because I'm staying home anyway. I know, but do, that's because they're not clear on the reason why we're staying home. 
So the reason why we're staying home is to slow down the acceleration so we don't overwhelm our healthcare workers. See, if we don't stay home and 10 times as many people get this 10 times as fast, our hospital workers won't be able to handle the load. Mm -hmm. So the only reason why we put these measures in place is to slow it down enough so that we can handle the load. Because otherwise, we're going to run out of spaces. We're not going to have enough space in our ICU, for example, in our intensive care units for people, as an example. So the reason why we're staying, and you're right, by the way, it's most likely there's going to be another jump in numbers in October when the flu season comes in, and we have to deal with that as well, which is another really great reason, by the way, to get yourself, you know, find out about this, get yourself knowledgeable Mm -hmm. about what's going on around it. Because what you're seeing on the news isn't necessarily the whole story. Um, Sean, so uh, tell us a little bit more about this um, fear and denial that some people are in, that um, the, everybody knows that we are in this pandemic now. But you ask somebody, talk to somebody, they say, well, we're fine, there's nothing wrong, and uh, we will go through this. Like in, uh, every day they wait for Dr. Bonnie Henry and Adrian Dix, they, what they say today, and they tune them in, and then they decide and like what kind of mood they're going to be in. So those things are really interesting. I just think waiting for anybody is usually a bad idea, right? Like, you know, I mean, I went and started to get myself educated because I had so many people coming to me um, concerned, right? So getting myself educated was one of the first things I did. And I went and worked with some really great people about this. And, you know, they literally showed me that in the recorded history of pandemics and of epidemics, for that matter, in recorded history, which is since 1200 A.D., no pandemic has ever lasted less than two and a half years from first case to last case. And usually it's an average of four years. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking like a short term thing here. People are acting like it's something short term, right? But just like we have political parties that change every four years, right? And that gives us four years of certain results. This is going to give us a few years of certain results. <laughs> yeah, th- that's true. But uh, there are other impacts and effects of this pandemic is now you cannot go to parties. You cannot go to the, you know, gatherings and uh, summer is coming in. People were used to going on the beaches and meeting each other on these uh, gatherings. And uh, now, like, how would they remember this? Uh, you know, a lot of people is changing weather in the summer, falling in love with each other, then they're going to plan their life. Now that's probably won't happen because they won't be getting out of their houses. Lots of them. It will definitely impact for some people. And the people who are saying, oh, we met in the summer of 67, you know, there's people who are saying that we will, we met in pandemic and she was wearing mask and I was wearing mask and we didn't see each other. We never knew each other. No, nothing happened. No relationship developed. But those kind of repercussions are there. Well, it is going to force human beings to get a lot more creative, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, I think that what we haven't done is looked at it from the perspective of what if this is the greatest gift we've ever been given so far? Mm-hmm. I mean, did you know that they're seeing Mount Everest for the first time in decades? Yeah, I have heard that, yes. Right? Pollution Why? is Because decreased. we're giving the planet a break. Yeah, exactly. See, it's not only an individual that needed a reset. The planet also needed a reset. Mm-hmm. So what if we took on that this whole pandemic is an opportunity to literally take a look at what works and doesn't work in life and actually be able to move what doesn't work into the working column? What if that were the whole reason for the entire thing? Mm-hmm. If, if this thing uh, it has a second phase, do you think they'll have even bad effect or this preparation of the first phase will help them handling the second phase? Well, I I think it'll help them for sure, you know, because people aren't going to be as scared the second time as we were the first time because nobody knew what was going to happen the first time. Mm -hmm. But again, this is all about learning. 
right? This is all about getting clear for yourself. Like, do am I doing what I need to do? Am I keeping myself safe? Am I keeping my family safe? Am I keeping anybody that could walk into my house safe? So that's the first thing. Are we safe? Then the second thing is, is are we really managing our daily life effectively given our circumstances are way different, given that we're now at home or given that we're now here or given, given whatever circumstances, are we managing that effectively? Mm -hmm. And I would say there's only a small part percentage of people that could actually answer yes, honestly to that. Yes. I'm managing effectively. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we know if we're managing effectively? Well, let's take a look at the different areas of life. So there's four main areas of life that you can look at. So you can look at, first of all, your career or your business, whatever you're doing to bring in money. Mm -hmm. Am I managing what I need to with COVID to still bring in money? Some people aren't, and that's where they're scared. That's where the stress is, is in that department. Mm-hmm. Okay, That's a great time to phone a financial coach. If you don't have one, let me know. I'll refer you. Or phone a, um, a, a financial coach or a, um, an employment coach if you don't have a job. Get a free session with an employment coach. There's lots of them out there that will do free sessions with you right now. Mm-hmm. But if that's the area of life where your highest stress level is, then go to work on that area during the pandemic. For some people, the biggest area for stress rate them for them is the area of relationship, social and intimate relationship. I can't tell you how many calls I've gotten from people that are like, how do I date now that I can't see anybody? Yeah. Right. So I'm getting, you know, and my the dating coaches that I have on my roster, I have I have a couple of coaches that just deal with dating and relationships. And they tell me that the creative ideas that people are coming up with are extraordinary. Hmm. Right. So it's if that's the area that you're having the most amount of stress around the area of relationships, then get in touch with a relationship coach. Start a support group for you and your friends around social and have a you know, a weekly gathering on Zoom where you meet just to socialize. You know, there's lots of things that you can do if that's the area where you have stress, okay? By the way, I'm going to send everybody that puts that sends me their email address, I'll send you a list of the five things you can do for each area, okay, each area of life. If you're stressed, if the stress level is highest in this area, here's what you do. If the stress level is highest in this area in health and well-being, here's the five things you can do. Can you give us the telephone number where we can send you the email? Yeah, so you're going to send it. You're going to send it to 604-716-6100. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you're just going to text your email address, and then I will make sure something gets sent out to you before the end of the weekend. Including uh, how to measure uh, your stress level. Yeah, the five different things you can do in each area. Mm-hmm. Okay. And by the way, if you are a business owner, okay, if you're a business owner and you're worried about how to ha- like how to reopen your business or have your business, you know, well, how about this, how to cover your butt as a business owner with COVID, you should definitely put that in your text to me. So, okay? Because I'll make sure that you get the information you need to make sure you're safe as a business owner. Okay? Sean, thank you very much. I really appreciate this. You're welcome. Yeah, whatever we can do to yeah. make people get through this time period with less stress and less anxiety and, you know, come out of it on the other side feeling like it was okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to another Red FM podcast. Don't forget to hit subscribe and check out our Red FM Canada YouTube channel. For further info, log on to our Red FM social media platforms or visit redfm.ca.